second to last chapter of the Nivim, Malachi Perak Bet. As we continue, we said yesterday, Malachi, well, it doesn't say Malachi in the beginning of chapter two. It's more of a continuation of chapter one. It's not clear if this is a name of a person or it's just a Malach of Hashem, a Malach of Yah, a, a messenger of God. Again, uh, chapter two of Yatalechem HaMitzvah Zot HaKonim. And now you priest, this mitzvah, this charge, this challenge, this commandment is for you. Remember in the last chapter, Malachi described how the Kohanim had been lax. They didn't listen. They're not bringing the correct sacrifice. They want to bring the junk to God, not the good stuff. If you don't listen to me, if you don't, uh, you know, respect my name and show it honor, then I will turn a curse. Your blessings will become curses because you did not listen to what I said. Now, Malachi, of course, is not being uh, great in his message to B'nai Yisrael, but think about it, it's not as bad. They're not worshiping idols, we're told here. They're just, they're just not really devoting their best to, to God. Hinani go er lachem et hazera v'zireti peresh. I'll put your seed under a ban and dung will be strung up uh, upon your faces. The dung of your sacrifices will be carried out. Right, Your sacrifices, in a sense, are like dung. So the dung is what's going to come. They're, you're giving me the junk. You're giving me the garbage. Continue in verse 4. Know that I've sent you this mitzvah, this command, this charge, because I have this covenant with the house of Levi. Going back to the time of the Torah, Egel Hazahav, the golden calf, Moshe says, who is with me against the golden calf? The Levites say that they are with Moshe. They are for God. God chooses them to serve him. God chooses one of their groups, the Aaron and his children, to be the high priests, the priests, the Levites, to assist them. There's a special relationship with God and the Kohanim and Levi'im and their, uh, their uh, work and service of the temple. And uh, so it's it's not uh, it's something that that God expects and continues with in verse five. Briti I taito, I had a covenant with him, achayim v'hashalom, one that was supposed to have life and peace. That name lo mora v'yira eni shmi nichatu, right? I I I gave him this covenant, and he was supposed to show me respect and and fear and honor. Because he stood in awe of my name. Who is it referring to specifically? Uh, presumably it refers to, you could say it refers to Aaron. Perhaps it refers to Aaron's grandson, Pinchas. Pinchas was given by God this brit shalom. Pinchas was given this covenant of, of peace and wholeness. Torah emet haita b'fiu v'abla lo nimsa b'svotav b'shalom u'mishor halachi tiv rabim heshiv me'avon. So, right, he had proper Torah, true Torah, true teachings in his mouth, and nothing uh, perverse or sick was coming from his lips. He walked in peace and in loyalty with me, and he held back from iniquity. So this is, uh, you know, uh, we've seen many uh, in many books where we complained about Bnei Yisrael amongst the people they've complained about the leaders, the Levites, the Kohanim, the the Malachim. So here Malachi draws a very beautiful picture. Whether it's going back all the way back to Aaron or all the way back to Pinchas, whether it's about the leadership uh, at later times, which we know was flawed, it's just interesting to say, see the way that he describes it, sort of that nostalgic way that everybody looks into the past and says that things were perfect, when of course very often they were far from being very perfect. But it's easier to uh, to say that than to say other things. And continue verse seven: Ki sevtecho hinish mudat v'torati v'kshumi pihu ki malach Adonai tzvaoti. Because the lips of the priest are supposed to guard knowledge. It says this in the Torah that the uh, lips are supposed to be, um, the Kohanim are supposed to, Yoru Mishpatech Yaakov Torah Tchal Yisrael, Moshe says in his, in his um, uh, blessings at the end of the Torah in Parsha of the Zoh Tabracha. They're supposed to teach Israel. Uh, they should teach Israel the laws. They should teach Israel the Torah, my commandments, my charge, what I want from them. And so the, the lips of the Kohen are supposed to uh, are supposed to uh, be full of knowledge. You're supposed to guard that knowledge. And uh, right, people are supposed to want to hear their Torah because he should be the messenger of God. 
that's ironic in this book. Malachi is coming to give a message to the Kohanim who are supposed to be the Malachim themselves. By the way, this verse, verse 7, where it says, Kisiv say Kohen Yishmeruda, that the um that the um the lips of the Kohen should be um uh, should be uh, you know, full of uh, full of of knowledge. Uh, there's a whole discussion. What if you have a, a teacher of Torah who is not a religious person, not a good person? His lips are not pure like this. And can you learn from him or not? And the problems that arise from such a person, somebody who's very wise, but somebody whose behavior isn't isn't great. We expect in the Torah community, in the Jewish community, not just to have somebody who's smart, but somebody whose behavior reflects uh, the teachings of Torah. But what have you done? You turned away. You made many stumble. You corrupted the covenant that the Levies had with God. And I, in turn, have made you despicable, you vile in the eyes of people. Because you disregard my ways and you show partiality, right? You you, you make a ruling based upon who is who is uh, is great. And we it just we we saw allusions to this idea of the Kohanim taking a greater role um, in the books of Haggai and Zechariah. Religious questions are asked of them, not just ritual questions regarding the temple, and so their ability to keep the people in line and and. Um, and inspire them or lead the people astray and down a bad path is much greater than it was in the beginning, in earlier uh, ages. Can we verse 10? We, this, this is uh, part of the understanding of what the Kohanim have done wrong. While it's not stated here, uh, explicitly is that they have far and wise. We'll see that more in the book of Ezra, which as we said yesterday is why some believe that Ezra is the author. Ezra is Malachi, that they are the same person. And part of the issue is intermarriage. Uh, it's, um, it's believed by many, but right, many of the uh, Bnei Yisrael, they return, they had their wives, their Jewish wives from Bavel, they return, they meet this, this new population, this new community, this community with young wives, they take on young wives, they get rid of the rest of them. And so that's sort of an understanding to verse 10 that that's part of the issue that we have with the Kohanim. We alluded to that back in the book of Zechariah, certain areas, the stains on the uh, uh, priest's clothing. And here sort of is the answer back. Do we have all one father? Didn't God create us? Why do we break faith with one another, profaning the covenant of our ancestors? Right? Why are you bothering me about uh, you know leaving my my uh, my Jewish wife behind and taking a new wife? What's the big deal? We're all from the same God. We're all from the same Creator. We're all descendants of Adam, according to the Torah. Who cares? El Nechar, just as Judah has broken faith and done disgusting things in Israel and in Yerushalayim, Yehuda has profaned that which is holy. And what have they done? They've desired the foreign women, and uh, the as well as foreign statues and idols. That's not what's supposed to happen. God will leave any man who's done this. Right? His descendants won't be in the town, tent of Jacob's and presenting offerings to the God of hosts. Now, there's an understanding in traditional Orthodox Judaism that matrilineal descent are Jewish if your mother's Jewish. So we have an allusion to it here in sort of this verse. If the men come and they're, they're leaving their wives and they're marrying these women who are not Jewish women, they're not going to be in the tents of Jacob. That's not a clear cut halacha. There were places where uh, tradition of patrilineal descent continued for many generations. I think Shia Kohn. Uh, uh, wrote a, a long book about it, academic study, and others. And so do this. Cover the altar of God with tears. Weep, moan, cry. Because God refuses the uh, sort of the sacrifices. God refuses what you're doing uh, for him. You want him to accept your offer, you're going to have to change your ways. And you'll say, why? Why is God refusing? We alluded to earlier. Why? Because you left. God is a witness. God is going to turn away from you because you left. You turned away from the wife of your youth, 
the one you've broken faith with. She was your partner. She was your covenant. She was your spouse. She was the mother of your children. You should be with her. And of course, we know this is sort of the other way. In so many of the earlier books we talked about, B'nai Israel leaving God. And uh, right, Hosea, for example, who who was told to to go and sleep with a prostitute because the prostitute is like B'nai Israel. They're they're leaving God. They're 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 they have no fidelity. They have no faithfulness to God. Here it seems the other way around. We're talking about B'nai Israel leaving their wives behind. Some of these men and 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 sinning in that way, which is also an allusion one could say to the fact that they are not faithful to God. Continue verse fifteen. <speaking in Hebrew> Didn't God, you're saying, yeah, didn't God make all of us? It's, don't we all have God's breath in us? Right. So so be careful of your breath and no one should break friends with the wife of his youth. Right. She's your wife. Don't don't go off in another way. God says that I do not like. Or I detest, according to some, divorce. I detest separation. Now, the Torah allows for divorce. We understand that sometimes couples can't get along, that it's better for them to be separate. It's better for, for their future, better perhaps for the future of their children. So God doesn't like that. But in a case like this, you're not doing it because uh, you're, you're doing it because you want the new shiny object, in a sense. And so covering yourself with lawlessness and, and as with a garment, God says, that's not going to work. That's treacherous. You, you know, you say, God, what have you, why are you doing this? What have you done for us? And God says, you know what you've done wrong? You've said good is bad and bad is good. And you're asking, what is justice? There's a question here about justice. Uh, B'nai Israel feel that the, that there things are not just for them. Things are not good. We talked to in the last chapter of the books of Zechariah and Malachi that, you know, things are not perfect here. They need to be inspired. They need to be pushed. The community is not all together. They they have uh, trouble with with locals. And uh, they they see, you know, despite the fact we built the Beit HaMikdash, things aren't perfect. Where is the Mishpat? Where is the justice from God? And God says to them, you think you're doing so great? You think you're perfect? You think that you deserve the justice that you're saying? That's not the way that it is. You guys have made many an error, many a mistake, and especially the leadership, starting with the Kohanim, who've made those errors. And so you want justice. You want things to be good. You need to reform. Go back to me, the God, the partner of your youth. Go back to the wives of your youth. Live within your community, and our community will prosper.